Good morning. It's good to see many of you. If you were not here last week when we uh, took a look at the the dome iconography, you can take a peek because we've covered a portion of the dome, but you can see for yourself. Those that were with us last week were amazed in how being in person to see the iconography um, for them was a very moving experience. But this, brothers and sisters, is only the beginning of the iconography of our new church, the next of which will be the four pentaves, which is the arched ceilings that rise to the dome that will include the four evangelists of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then later the three apses, the platitera behind the altar, the resurrection and crucifixion apses on the north and south. Before the iconostasion is brought, we just learned all of the carving for the altar is complete. The shipment will take a while, so God willing, when it arrives, we will be closer to provisional occupancy, whatever that means. <laughs> in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Christ is in our midst. <laughs> so today, the Sunday that follows, last Sunday, the Holy Feast of Pentecost, the descent of the Holy Spirit, we commemorate since the time of the fourth century in Antioch, the Sunday of All Saints. In the Western Church, All Saints Day is the first of November, and the eve of which is called All Hallows' Eve. But for we Orthodox, the Sunday after the Feast of Pentecost has a connection to the feast celebrating the descent of the Holy Spirit in that the saints were empowered. And we'll be speaking about that in a moment. I'm going to try to make this simple in talking about the saints of all ages that we commemorate today. Many people often ask us, well, why do I need to pray, have an intercessor as a saint? Well, nobody's going to force you to. However, <clears throat> When you need help from somebody, certainly you make a phone call and call someone, or you need to pay a bill and don't have cash, you'll call a bank. We all know how to get help when we need it. <clears throat> and if we truly believe in the resurrection, <clears throat> we certainly believe that the dead in Christ are with him, for the scripture says, to be absent in the flesh is to be present with the Lord, or elsewhere. <laughs> Depending upon how much you love, have acknowledged Christ as the truth, or rejected, denied, or ignored God, that's where you'll end up. It's that simple. So we believe that saints, as the epistle says in the Hebrews by Paul, and heard today, we are surrounded by these great witnesses. And the image that Paul presents is like a stadium. And we being in a contest on the field. And they are the witnesses. Praying, cheering us on. And so we are surrounded by these men and women, and the word to us is to get rid of everything that inhibits or hinders, including the sin that entangles our life, so that we can run with perseverance the race, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the, the joy. <laughs> set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we are not alone, folks. <clears throat> we are not alone. There are many categories of saints, and we hear these categories if we attend to the proscomedi, the prayers of preparation when the offering is prepared. And they include the ranks beginning first with the Virgin Mother of God, 
the angels, the prophets, the prophets beginning with John the Baptist, who is the last of the Old Covenant prophets. That's why he's on the Equinostasion. The apostles, hierarchs, ecumenical teachers, martyrs, ascetics, unmercenary healers, those doctors that had the gift of healing that did not request payment for their services, unmercenaries. Men and women who were glorified after death. Men and women who left a, and this is the point about our orthodox belief in the saints and who is a saint different from the Western church. Men and women who left a persistent memory in the hearts and minds of the church, resulting in their glorification, not forgotten. So in our church, there is no criteria that a person has to have the evidence of miracles to be categorically considered a saint. And by the way, we are all called to be saints. And sainthood is determined by the church according to the account of a person's life. The formation of You have to bear with me. For some reason, my computer is just not doing what I want it to do. Okay. The formation of church hymnography and iconography is therefore created when a particular person becomes glorified as a saint by the church and their feast day is the date of their departure from this life. When their Relics are exhumed. That's why we don't cremate. Their relics are exhumed and distributed among the faithful for veneration. And every church has traditionally a relic of a particular saint. Our particular relic is of Saint Raphael of Brooklyn. We don't have one of Saint Michael the Archangel. So St. Raphael is the relic of our church that's in the Antimension, will be permanently placed in the new and permanent altar of our new church. As we pray when we do memorials, like we have two today, with the spirits of the righteous made perfect, give rest to the soul of thy servant. The celebration is with all who love God and whose heart is ready and willing to serve him and who are called to be agios, holy. Meaning, to be called separate and distinctive, whose lives are the models and examples of faith and love, whose lives have demonstrated Christian virtue. And that memory becomes so persistent that their life lives on in the mind of the church especially the local church of which they lived and where people have known them, and not just stories as fables, but their life as it exemplified the person of Jesus Christ is told from generation to generation as a concrete example of how we live the Christian life. And so it includes everyone from cooks, to gardeners, and so many more categories of saints. Now, as Christians, we are personally called to become separate, but not independent, not in isolation, not even to be exclusive or, exclusive or inaccessible. To be separate, to be agios, is to be engaged in the world. Every Christian is called to be agios, as those who are chosen and sanctified. Simply stated, saints, saints are part of a community who are active in knowing and loving God. They are blessed as often as they commit themselves each day to love the Lord our God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength, and their neighbor 
as themselves. For we are taught by the Holy Apostle John that no one can say that he loves God and not his neighbor. Second, Christians are called to reach out to others in service and charitable good works, also to be prepared to tell their story. For the Apostle Paul reminds us to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason of the hope that you have. You know, in this day and age, folks, having come out of this unique year, there's a lot of people that need a message of hope. And this is the time for the church to now engage in telling others the good news. Hopefully, you have good news to tell, not bad news. Hopefully, you are spending your time during the day focusing upon what is good, honorable, pleasant, admirable, godly, and not upon those things that will be a weight, as the epistle talked about, that bring us down. And that we, what we share with others may be an encouragement to them. That's not to say that we're not realistic, but it's to help people know how to look up not to look down on others. So what do we know about the saints from God's perspective? All those who are baptized in Christ have passed from this life to the next. <clears throat> and the readings from last night tells us from the book of Solomon, which is the apocryphal texts of the Catholic Church, East and West. It says, the souls of the righteous are in the hands of God. There's no torment to touch them. In the sight of the unwise, they seem to die, and their departure is taken for misery. And they're going from us to be utter destruction, but they are in peace. The righteous live forever, and their reward is the Lord, and the care of them is with the Most High. Therefore, they shall receive the kingdom of majesty and the crown of comeliness from the Lord's hand. For with his right hand shall he cover them, and with his arm shall he protect them. So what does it mean to be righteous? Who are the righteous? Are you and I called to be righteous? David, the prophet, and the psalmist said in the first verse of Psalm number 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but who takes delight in the law of the Lord and meditates on it day and night. That's where we get hope. Who does not take advice from the wicked, and I like this next phrase in the English, trend, or the American translation, nor loiters in the way that sinners take. I love that. Are you a loiterer among sinners? <laughs> or that atmosphere? So, those who walk in the truth, who are unafraid of truth, which is, by the way, Christ and his teaching, who love the truth and who speak the truth in love, as the epistle says, the just, whose aim is justice, not lawlessness, not disorder, not chaos, whose pleasure is in doing good, whose focus is upon what is true, just, pure, lovely, of good report, virtuous, things or what merits praise. Philippians 4, 8. This is what exemplifies the heroes of the faith. You know, when you have truth and you know truth, you have to be a steward of the truth. And stewardship is not only about finances. <laughs> it's just like as a parent who knows more 
and is more experienced cannot possibly help a young person understand certain things until that time comes. And so as stewards of the truth, we don't use truth to beat people over the head, to condemn people, to make ourselves look better than them. That is not to be stewards of the truth, to be merciful, to bring the whole message of God's compassion, love, and mercy, and the forgiveness of sins. That is the truth. That is the mission of the church. To promote reconciliation. To help people learn how to be overcome. Not to be overcome by sin, but to know forgiveness. Who fear God and not evil. <laughs> Who fear God. And that does not mean to abhor God. But to reverence Him. In knowing that He knows it all, we don't. In acknowledging that he is the source of all things. Who fear God and not the evil one. Because God reigns over Satan. And will even use Satan for his goals and his objectives. That's why when you see Pantocrator. <laughs> that iconography that fuses the image of a just and righteous judge. Who is our Lord our Savior of mercy, love, and compassion. There's very few people that can, that have the gift to convey that in a vision. Also, saints are those who bear the fruit of the Spirit, kindness, merciful, forgiving, long-suffering, who are humble and meek, not weak. Meek is not being weak. The basis and foundation of sainthood is that they were men and women who were repentant sinners. No different from what you and I are called to be. People who deny God don't understand this and they, be, they may be found among those who choose violence and are numbered among those who are committed to a different kind of martyrdom. A martyrdom that is based solely upon self-interests, exclusivity, a new Gnosticism, <laughs> which is an old heresy, that does not submit or respect any authority and lacks personal responsibility and accountability, resulting in the glorification of anarchy and lawlessness. These are people that are not on their way to sainthood, even though they might be a kind of martyr of a different species. And it is because of this kinds of threats that we face in our life today, that it's important for us not only to know what we believe, but to bear the light of truth upon the darkness of evil. Also to remain strong and steadfast in our hope who is Christ. And if there are laws that are wrong, and there are, we must change them. But how we go about doing that is not through violence. That change comes by a persistent voice from a majority who in exercising their freedom of speech and privilege of their personal voice causes there to be a change. So then, for example, as we as Christian witnesses believe in the full dignity of all human life, we also believe that we must be governed by laws that protect, guard, preserve all human life. And at the same time, defend the dignity of every person who is law-abiding as a citizen and is committed to upholding the truth. So finally, a good Christian witness is someone with personal discipline, whose lifestyle has a framework and structure with boundaries. Freedom does not mean there are no boundaries. As we are teaching our young people today, you know, 
Intimacy is defined by boundaries. With no boundaries, there really is no intimacy. You are delusional. <laughs> so the disciplines of the Christian includes prayer, fasting, attending church, not neglecting the sacraments or preparation for it, repentance, just to name a few. And should you and I regard these things to be mere rituals, then they only are a part of our family heritage and culture, or if we view them as ornaments of our faith, then you and I have to yet learn what it means to venture into the deep understanding of our tradition. And there's a lot of it to learn, more than what a lifetime will reveal. And our lives will be like children in shallow water without spiritual power. I don't need to remind you today that there's a great deal about our American way of life that has dominated the national attitude towards religion. The value of our independent way of thinking causes us to formulate for ourselves the way that we are most comfortable with in practicing our religion, a kind of smorgasbord or buffet religion. You know, when you pick and choose what we like and disregard those aspects of our tradition that we don't like. <clears throat> like some of you watching via live streaming. <clears throat> you know, I want to just see the sermon, forget the rest. Or I just want to hear the choir and their wonderful harmony and pray with the choir. Oh, I just want etc. etc. Smorgasbord. Every baptized Christian who bears God's Spirit in their life will be challenged. We cannot be men and women, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers who are complacent. We cannot remain as children content in a wading pool. We have to grow up. And today's Christian must be very courageous and devoted, fervent in prayer. This kind of courage and devotion is not something that manifests itself without spiritual power. We just learned during the Feast of Pentecost that what Jesus described as that fountain of life is an unending source that contributes to an unending growth of theosis. You can be 20, 30, 40, 60, 80, 100. You can still grow. That's right. Even beyond this life, there's more to grow. That's our teaching. There is no arriving. Once saved, always saved, just by a personal decision. No. Repentance is a lifetime recovery program. And so theosis is the potentiality that Adam and Eve had and gave up, thinking they could hide. And what did God do? He says, Adam, where are you? As if he didn't know. But God began the conversation which he completed when he became a man. In person, communicating the truth. Also, spiritual power is not manifested in the ways of physical or political might. If you study the fourth century and what followed, you will greatly, quickly understand what I'm talking about during our Bible study on Tuesday nights, because I don't have time to go into it. It requires being grounded in the knowledge of the truth, beginning with Christ as the truth. Remember when he stood before Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate says, what is truth? So you think that today we are in a late age of torment? It started then with Pontius Pilate saying to Jesus, what is truth? And standing right in front of him was the truth, the way and the life. It means being steadfast, unshakable in faith and deeply rooted in love with discernment and prayer. You and I, our children, our grandchildren, are the products of the daily choices we make. This includes how many hours we spend at work, 
how many hours we spend with our families, the sources, of, the sources we choose to be informed by and influenced by, we're in how we choose to spend our resources, just to name a few. And while you and I may not be called to be apostolic, as the twelve were, there's much to be done in fulfilling our call as parents, teachers, by informing, advising, guiding, guarding, and protecting, and most importantly, to be witnesses. It begins with acknowledging what are our personal responsibilities and taking them seriously. Doing our best in all that we will ultimate, ultimately be accountable to God. Christ is in our midst. 